We wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of our region, the Paramount people, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since time immemorial. We honour those of the ancestors of this land, whose irrepressible spirituality flows through the corporation. We acknowledge with gratitude that we share this land today and sorrowfully acknowledge the historical as well as intergenerational costs of that sharing. We would also like to acknowledge our hope and belief that we are moving to a place of equity, justice and partnership together for the future. Hello everyone. I'm Eleanor Waterford and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second evening of our Year 12 project presentations. We're so glad to have you with us, whether in person or in spirit. We've begun our journey together this year with rich stories, images, and even song, and more awaits. Before we begin, can I ask those of you with us this evening to please turn off your mobile phones and sit with us in the present for a while. Let's open our minds and hearts. As Liam joined us yesterday, Let's be open to what we can learn from the students. The late poet John O'Donoghue outlined that a threshold is a line which separates two territories of spirit. And very often how we cross is the key thing. Presenting your year 12 project is crossing a threshold and takes some courage. But our students are not alone. We, their community, are here to witness and to listen. Today, I would like to begin by making space to hear from some of the significant people who have been on this journey with Class 12. We work in partnership with parents every day to support children's growth. And I would like to honor the role of the parents in our community too. So on behalf of the Class 12 parents for this year, I have asked Daniel and Rachel Hocken to introduce this evening's presentations. Before they come down, I just have to say, go well, Class 12. You've got this. And welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I'd like to open with an acknowledgement of country that I heard recently by Asher, a former student of this class who presented his project on poetry at our sister school, Wollonga. It's called Cry. If I were in Uluru when it rained and the water chose its path down my face, if the mist revealed deeper mystery, the magical force of that rock my eyes would mimic, the floods would come. Silent I would sit, embracing the tears from both. Mesmerizing is all I could think. Yet as an inexplicable feeling and questions would come, this ancient place. Damn it, just treat them right. They were here first. This is their land. They have so much to teach. I cry, the rock cries, and so should you. Well, welcome everybody, um, and it's great to be with you on the second day of the special projects. What a wonderful day we had last, uh, last night with the seeing about the challenges of learning to fly, to sustainable fashion choices, to the thrill of riding a trail that you built yourself, and the benefits of purposeful practice in following a creative passion. Wow. As I stand before you tonight on Paramount land, I just wanted to honor the courage it takes our students to present to you all, both in this space and online, both locally and internationally. My name's Dan, and I'm the father of Will and Charlotte. I wear a few hats here, but today I'm speaking to you as a parent with my wife, Rachel. We've been blessed to be part of this journey for nearly 15 years now, from singing songs and kneading the dough in playgroup, making those first connections, 
through learning the ropes in kindy with support from our mentor parents, before going into primary school, and then finally walking across the oval to join high school. We are fortunate enough to have forged lifelong connections through supporting the school on those class camps, to organizing those spring fairs, um, to sitting at, in, um, in the rain at winter festivals with silence and reverence. Each year delivering another group of independent young adults who will leave this place to start the next chapter of their journey. For us, our school community is a bit like a forest. Every part of the unique ecosystem is important. From the large stoic trees, the curious little fungi, the fallen leaves, new shoots, the roots that nobody sees, and the quiet but important stones. The old and the new. Every person in our community is important, and everybody plays an important role. Throughout this journey, a couple of things have stood out to us that we would like to share with you parents a little further back up the road. We have witnessed the value and strength of this community, the importance of the class carer in supporting the teacher, the value of Steiner education, not only for the child, but also for the parents, and the courage and the collective responsibility we all need to possess to have those difficult conversations when they pop up along the way. On reflecting what it, it is that brings people into a ward of education, it struck me that fate, connection, and a curiosity about a different approach all resonated. Teachers often speak of a fit that fulfills their professional and spiritual journeys, and parents speak of a breadth of education it offers, nurturing the whole being and allowing the gentle unfolding of the individual. There are no preconceived ideals or molds for what are meant to come. Delivering content through storytelling and, storytelling and experience, rather than textbook learning and regurgitating, if you ask any of these students here before you tonight, they'll tell you they create their own books. In this fast-paced world, it is refreshing to know that time is also honored here by giving the space required to be a child and to respond to each developmental age at the right time. The timing of meeting the students at the right development stage can most recently be seen with this class, on your left, or left of me tonight, delving into reflection and identity through a self-portrait self that I think some of you have seen here today in the foyer and online, a 5,000 word thesis to complement what you are hearing from each student tonight, and a recent philosophy main lesson addressing everything from what it means to be human and our place on this fragile planet. And yes, this was all happening in the same couple of weeks. With each main lesson, by engaging their head, heart, and hands, compassion and emotional maturity are all developed through dialogue. I'm a firm believer that we grow through dialogue with each other and was recently introduced to the book Sand Talk while yarning with Will one night discussing the philosophy main lesson. The book is by Tyson Yonkapura, an Aboriginal man from far north Queensland, and gives a view on everything from thermodynamics to past civilizations through exploring the ego and integral theory, all from an indigenous perspective. It struck me after reading this book how fortunate our students are to work with insight like this in their class, considering these perspectives and challenging conventional thinking. When Tyson was asked, what do you think or what do you hope these readers will take away from them um, after reading this book, his reply was, I hope they will see the sacred role, their sacred role as custodians of creation and each will find their unique way of contributing to the diversity and true sustainability of this complex system that they inhabit. When I mentioned dialogue before, I thought I'd like to elaborate a little bit by talking about some thoughts that, by William Isaac, who suggests, dialogue is about a shared inquiry. It is a way of thinking and reflecting with each other. It is not something you do at someone. It is something that you do with another person. 
The intention of dialogue is to reach new understanding and in doing so to form a totally new basis on which, from which to think and which to act. In dialogue, not, one not only solves problems, one dissolves them. We do not merely try and reach agreement, we try and create a context from which many new agreements may come. And we seek to uncover a base, base of shared meaning that can greatly help coordinate and align our actions with our values. From my observations, when we dig a little bit deeper and when we lean into discomfort and really try and question what the future could be for ourselves, I like to think there is an optimism and a beauty that may emerge. We need to get past the binary conversations and engage with the space in between if we are truly trying, going to meet the challenges of this complex future. Class 12, I have valued our time together over all of these years, and it's been a privilege to see the amazing young adults you have all become. I am deeply grateful to all the staff and the parents joining us tonight and online who have supported you along your way. Go well, Class 12, and know that the community today with you will always be here to support you, to hold you, to yarn with you, and to love. I'd now like to ask you just to quickly close your eyes while Rachel reads a poem. Everything Has a Deep Dream by Rachel Naomi Ryman. I've spent many years learning how to fix life, only to discover at the end of the day that life is not broken. There is a hidden seed of greater wholeness in everyone and everything. We serve life best when we water it and we befriend it, when we listen before we act. In befriending life, we do not make things happen according to our own design we uncover something that is already happening in us and around us and create conditions that enable it. Everything is moving towards a place of wholeness, always struggling against odds. Everything has a deep dream of itself and its fulfilment. Thanks, Rach. And to Eden and to Ashley and to... Charlotta, sorry, didn't see you there. All the best for tonight. We wish you luck and we're really looking forward to it. Go well. Good evening, everyone. Welcome or welcome back. Our next speaker has been on the tools this year, building his very own space. Please welcome Eden McMahon. Oh. In 2015, when I was in class six and my younger brother was in class four, Foursquare was all the rage, <laughs> especially with his class who had just gotten access to the court. I say this because every day he would come home and start bouncing his ball against the door of our shared bedroom in mom's house. Every day, all day, he was relentless and eventually it got to me. Uh, regardless of intent, it worked. I moved out of his room and uh, into the spare room in Dad's house, um, which is barely 20 metres away from Mum's. Yeah, that's, two, that's right, we have two houses on our property, which sounds like a lot, right? You'd think that would mean having oodles of free space. Unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> even my new room in Dad's house was, and still is, a little bit cramped. And while it fulfills its space as a bedroom, it's by no means spacious. Why am I telling you all this? 
Well, consider this setting the scene for my speech. Uh, these were the preconditions in which I came up with the idea. I always needed some more space. It didn't have to be much, just a comfortable little room with a little more space, a little more privacy, an area to relax, stare off into the distance, host friends, guests, classmates, a place to go when I was just sick of everyone. The idea was always there. The real question was, how? If it isn't clear already, this was the basis for my Year 12 project, creating my own space. So, there was the idea, to build myself a space. At its core, the founding concept for my project has remained fundamentally unchanged. It's just that initially, I had big and, to be frank, unrealistic dreams. I overestimated my uh, building abilities quite a lot. I was by no means an experienced builder. Sure, by year seven, I'd become quite proficient at cobbling together crossbows out of household materials, but building a full-blown house was definitely not the next logical step in the development of my skills. And I knew this, sort of, but I didn't really know the full extent of how much I was getting myself in for. Ideas for how I could solve this space problem began as far back as year 10, where I began, along with my parents, to brainstorm how to realize this idea. Unfortunately, I was ambitious and a little bit dumb, as I had intended to design and construct what was essentially a full-fledged house on our property, and had my sight set on it being a large, luxurious, straw bale design. Yeah, I know that would have been a monumental undertaking in and of itself, let alone doing class 12, but there we go. The plan was pull down the little red shed up the top of our property, All right. Um, oh, there you go. And replace it with this wonder house. Um, it took me quite a while to realize and come to the realization that this trajectory was not one that was doable. And in the meantime, I began my doomed deep dive into the world of straw bale houses. In the weeks following the last term of year 11, whilst stressing profusely about the imminence of year 12, uh, just around the corner, and my complete inexperience in the areas of planning, design, and construction, you know, the big ones, I began to familiarize myself with the world of straw bale design. My research consisted mostly of trawling the web and procrastinating watching actual educational construction videos by watching time lapses of Canadian bloats whipping together cabins in the snow. I began creating crude designs for the house, sketching possibilities, working out dimensions, materials, and systems like electrical and plumbing, as well as beginning the arduous process of clearing out the shed in preparations for its destruction. I even began to consult the leading straw bale builder in South Australia, Lance Carl. We communicated through email, phone calls, and even in person, as I got to spend a day with him on a site in Palmer, just outside of Manham, where I got to learn the basics of straw bale construction. By this point, I was in. There wasn't really any turning back. It was around this time, however, that I began to worry about the feasibility of the idea. I started to finally doubt my own abilities. And as the idea began to become more and more fleshed out, I realized the scope of the immense undertaking I was preparing for. These suspicions were solidified by a meeting with my grandfather, a master builder of over 60 years experience who, through careful explanation, outlined what was going to be necessary to realize this idea. Needless to say, this list was long and unattainable, just a few of the problems being my complete inexperience as a builder, the fact that it would have cost a minimum of 30,000, the fact that I was also doing year 12, and that it would have been sort of illegal. <laughs> Need I go on? Following this revelation, I was sent reeling. I was equal parts stressed and relieved as I realized I'd have to change my project, but to what I didn't really know. I fell into a hole. I was unsure where I could possibly take my project next and briefly entertained the idea that I could dedicate it to a more specialized aspect of the project, the architecture, which, I, which would mean a purely theoretical approach. But it didn't take me long to realize that I was definitely not comfortable with this either. And I was back to square one. I was still unhappy. I was too far into jump ship, but continuing would mean sinking. 
when suddenly I found my lifeboat. It hit me like a lightning bolt. The studio, a smaller, more conventionally built, and much more legal building. Down on, and luckily, I had the perfect spot for it. Down on the hill, about 50 meters away from my mother's house, there's a small clearing. Slightly overgrown, and it overlooks the valley with a set of concrete footings that could potentially support a structure. And so I basically restarted my entire project, setting off on this new course to build this little getaway nook down on the hill. Luckily, I wouldn't be going into this completely unarmed, as I'd spent a great deal of time in the holidays of late 2020 to early 2021 inadvertently learning the ins and outs of construction and framing. At this time, I believed I'd be building something straw bale in nature, so I naturally learned more, lent more towards that aspect, which could have been a problem, but in my case, this period of preliminary research was vital to get me to where I am now. I owe a great deal to the work of these two legends, Dave Whipple and Graham Genvey, or, as they are known online, Bush Radical and Woodness Goodness. <laughs> These two YouTubers were amazing sources of inspiration and entertainment throughout my project. Their respective cabin build walkthroughs were two of my biggest inspirations for the design of the studio, and both were instrumental in helping me get a grip on the basics of construction. My design, much like their designs, is very simple. And despite all that talk earlier about unconventional building, is conventional in nature consisting of what is essentially a singular rectangular room with a front window, a side window, and a door. The main thing that sets this, this design apart from the rest is its single pitch roof, which I opted for instead of the tried and true A-frame triangular design on the basis that it would be considerably easier to design and build. With the exception of a brief meeting with my grandfather to adjust the design of the roof, I created this design for the studio completely myself in a free online program called SketchUp. Now, uh, just as a side note, if there are any professional builders in the crowd, um, consider this a trigger warning. Uh, <laughs> feel free to look away or, or wince loudly at any point during the speech. <laughs> so, although the initial draw to the site was a set of four concrete footings on which used to be a veranda, it didn't take me long to discover that these were absurdly out of square and level, and that I'd have to start the studio from complete scratch, constructing my own foundation. It began with a clearing of the site, where we cut away overhanging branches and cleared away plants that had grown over it in its time of disuse. Because of how small and light the building was, it didn't make sense to pour a massive concrete slab to support its weight. So after a bit of research, uh, I instead opted for a concrete footing design, which I was initially dubious about, but after learning about standing Alaskan cabins over 100 years old built with this technique, and the fact that our own house was built with it, which has been standing strong for nearly 50 years, it seemed like a no-brainer. This process was painstaking and arduous, however, as we spent almost two whole days hacking away at ground comprised almost entirely of solid rock, as well as adjusting the footings an innumerable amount of times to get everything perfectly level and square. On top of these footings were dynabolted three three meter long bearers, 100 millimeters by 200 millimeters. These are what support and will bear the weight of the building, spreading it out across the footings. The floor joists were then screwed onto these bearers. To ensure that the floor didn't become icy in winters, we filled in between the joists with insulation to keep the floor toasty warm and energy efficient. After a couple of weeks of me messing about with the insulation, as I could only really work on weekends and holidays, it finally became time to screw on our structure floor. This was attached with screws and very generous amounts of construction adhesive to prevent creaking. Although at that point, all I really had was what resembled a stage or maybe a Waldorf interpretation of a dance floor. <laughs> um, the footprint of the studio had taken shape and I was starting to get an idea of how it would actually look. This was also the point where I realized it would have a really, really good view. 
<laughs> in the weeks leading up to this, uh, I had been in frequent contact with my grandfather, John McMahon, as he had very generously offered to help us with the framing process. Throughout the first five days of framing, he served as an unofficial mentor and at times site manager to me, Levi, and my dad, who, who both helped immensely in this period. As I mentioned already, John has over 60 years experience in construction, and as such, upon showing him the design, he immediately created a perfect 3D model of it in his head, which he likely kept to the, next to the impressive mental spreadsheet of all the specifications, costs, and dimensions of the materials we worked with. John was also extremely generous with his tools, as he brought us his trailer packed to the brim with top-notch saws, drills, sanders, and other various bits and bobs. These made the construction process considerably easier, and I have no doubt that we would have struggled without them. The frame is like the skeleton of a structure. It's what basically everything else is built upon, and therefore, it's essential to have it level, square, and strong. I'm happy to say that my frame is all three of those, thanks to careful and precise measurements, but mainly due to what was used to screw it all together, bugles. Bugles, or bugle-headed timber screws, are my secret ingredient. Each one of these can hold up to a ton, and over the course of framing, several hundred were used. Needless to say, it's a very solid little building. Continuing with my skeleton metaphor, the bones of the walls were 90 by 35 timber and spaced at 400 millimeters, with slightly thicker 90 by 35s supporting the corners and either side of the front window. As the side walls were angled, they needed to be identical. John taught me a trick for this, using a chalk line to mark out the shape to turn the floor into a template on which we could build the walls on top of one another. This took a couple of days, and it felt like we were going nowhere until, in a span of less than half an hour, they were lifted upright and I could definitively see the shape of the building that, until then, had really just been an idea. Needless to say, this was extremely gratifying. Undeniably, the most physically exerting part of the project was uh, carrying the 500 plus kilogram window about 80 meters or so down the hill. From the moment we acquired the window, we realized it was going to be a nightmare to transport. Making sure to take frequent breaks and be as safe as possible, me, Levi, Dad, John, an Allgate hardware employee named Lewis, and Trenton over there carried it down. By day three of framing, we were on to constructing the roof. This involved fabricating and installing rafters perpendicular to the direction of the building, as well as outriggers connecting to the rafters, allowing overhang on the front and back. On top of the rafters was then rolled a layer of sizolation, which is kind of like the building equivalent of cling film or foil, on top of which were screwed overlapping sheets of corrugated roofing metal. On the fifth and final day, with John's help, the cladding was put up. Cladding was something I went back and forth on over for quite a while. At first, I was intent on a modern, rendered look, but as I researched and realized the skill required to make render actually look good, I wasn't so sure. It was in this period of indecision that I decided on blue board, an easy to work with waterproof cement sheeting, as it would basically be a blank slate in which I could do anything later on. Just like with the roof, before mounting the blue board, the walls were surrounded in a layer of overlapping isolation to prevent moisture and other undesirable things from entering the walls. The blue board cladding was then mounted with clouts, a type of wide, flat-headed nail. With the exclusion of the gyp rock, this marks the end of John's physical involvement in the project, and I am eternally grateful for his help throughout. The period following cladding mostly revolved around sealing the building to be completely animal and waterproof before I could begin work on the internals. A large portion of this was making the eaves and adjusting the fascia boards, which involved cutting and installing a lot of wooden fastening battens to which the eaves could be mounted. This was a very fiddly process, as little inconsistencies and natural mistakes in the rafters could own created problems that could only be fixed after hours of messing around with chocks and spaces to create the look of a straight and level roof. The fascia boards put up an especially big fight. 
as not only did we have to deal with inconsistencies in the rafters, but warps in the boards themselves, which could only be fixed to a certain extent before we just had to accept that that was as good as we were going to get it and leave it at that. This section also involved the installation and fabrication of a gutter to prevent water from simply flowing off the back and turning the foundations into sludge. From the very, very beginning, creating a well-insulated space was paramount to me. It was important to me that on cold days I could waltz around on the floor without having to worry about getting frostbite, something that isn't guaranteed in Mum's house, as her floor isn't insulated. This was admittedly a very satisfying part of the process, knowing that I was building very possibly the highest quality bu building on the property. <laughs> Up until now, almost all of the work had been external, but now that it was completely waterproof and the jib rock had arrived, it was time to work on the inside. This began with insulation, where I cut out bats with a Stanley knife and pressed them into the walls, making sure to fill all cracks, as good insulation is as effective as its weakest spot. Although it didn't by any means look like the inside of a finished room, it sounded like it. For the first time, it was beginning to feel like a room. Now finally came time to install the jip rock. We began with the ceiling, using a string line trick that John taught us to hold the bats of roof insulation in place while we awkwardly pushed the jip rock up and fastened it with stud adhesive and plaster screws. Like the insulation, the jip rock was cut with a Stanley knife, as it's a really soft, essentially just a sheet of chalk sandwiched between two bits of paper. We also took the liberty of installing the side window, which until then had just been sitting forlornly at the back wall. From then on, the project was nearly entirely me. I had the privilege of working on the jip rock all by my lonesome. Up next was flushing the recently installed jip rock, which for a beginner was no small feat. Flushing requires rather a large amount of patience and skill. I had neither, and as such, made a fair few mistakes. Flushing was what made me realize why there are professionals for this type of thing. <laughs> it simply requires talent. Apply a little too much compound, and you have to wait for it to dry, and then apply more. Apply too much, and you have to spend ages sanding it down. Luckily, the majority of these mistakes weren't cosmetic, and I managed to scrape by with a clean-ish looking end product. To add insult to injury, when I'd finally gotten used to the consistency of interior flushing compound, I was thrown back in the deep end once again when it finally came time to flush the blue board, and I found out that the hard way, the blue board compound is an entirely different, much sloppier beast. The electrical situation for the studio was relatively simple. The top concern was the distance, the main worry being voltage drops over the 50 odd meters that the cable would have to run. Fortunately, I personally didn't have to fuss much about the details as electrical was the one thing a professional was hired for. If there's anything you don't want to be handling with inexperience, it's 240 volts. <laughs> as the building is elevated by nearly a meter at the front, it required a veranda to allow people to actually be able to enter the building, but also to extend the room its itself, creating a feeling of spaciousness. This would also just create a great space to hang out in general, maybe for watching the sunrise or relaxing on warm summer evenings. For this, I was fortunate enough to have access to some beautiful, sustainably farmed Victorian ash decking left over from when we redid our own deck a couple of years ago. Normally this wood is very expensive, so I was extremely lucky that I could create the deck at a fraction of the cost of new wood. The veranda steps were a classic example of the importance of creating a design beforehand. Initially, Dad and I planned on simply creating the steps on the spot, but when we attempted this, we cut one of the runners wrong, which was a $20 mistake. This prompted me to create a detailed design as to avoid the potentiality of any future mistakes by making those mistakes in the digital world first. Simultaneously to us building the deck, Mum offered very generously to paint the interior. Mum, who's very experienced in the realms of paint and color in general, took command of this while Dad and I gratefully stood back and let the master work. The paint drastically changed how the room felt. It, the, the clean white compared to the patchy appearance of the flushing made it feel less like a bunker and more like a bedroom. 
The, for the floor, after much debate, we settled on genuine pine floorboards. These were installed parallel to the direction of the building to create a sense of length, but also just to you know, make it look nice. To secure them to the structure floor, they were nailed down through their grooves with a healthy amount of construction adhesive and nails to prevent any shifting or creaking. They were then sanded to smoothen and level them and were stained to imbue the wood with a rich, darker tone. Following stain, the, blue board, the floorboards were then coated with four layers of semi-gloss estopol polyurethane varnish, which had to be lightly sanded between coats. This took a while and is still off-gassing to this day. This was, and is, an exercise in patience. As mentioned before, the external finish was something I went back and forth on quite a bit. But finally, I decided on a compromise between paint and render, textured paint. This was essentially a mixture of sand and paint which was applied with a highly textured roller. This was quite a time-consuming and paint-consuming process. What I didn't realize about sand is that it absorbs paint like a sponge. It took roughly three coats to achieve an even finish that concealed the flushing, which doesn't sound that bad, but believe me, it was an unholy amount of paint. Although at this point, I probably could have just called it a day and moved furniture in, uh, it still needed a few finishing touches before I could officially declare it done. These included installing and painting the internal architraves and skirting boards, which were generously donated by my grandfather, hemming and installing the curtains, thanks mum for the great job with the sewing, and fixing up the old fly screen that came with the window, as well as doing a little landscaping and clean up of the surrounding area and the shed, as they had both gotten quite messy over the course of the construction. The final step was to actually put stuff in it, and I'm still working on that one. Currently, the studio is populated by a simple rug, a mattress, and a bunch of pillows, which is great for now, as it genuinely is a great spot just to sit and stare out the window, but I do plan on putting some more permanent furniture in there in the future. And that's it. That marks the completion of the building, just as this speech marks the completion of my project. And while that may be so, it's only really the beginning for the studio, which has a whole lifetime of use ahead of it. I entered this year with the admittedly very utilitarian goal of creating something practical and comfortable. And also, if I'm being completely honest, something to serve as a break from the rest of the schoolwork of year 12. I'm really happy to say I got just that. This was an extremely rewarding and character building process. The feeling of looking at something tangible, practical, and architecturally sound, and being able to say proudly, I built that, is truly like no other. The highly hands-on practical nature of my project sort of let me procrastinate without actually procrastinating. It's like I'd spend a weekend down on site and still technically be doing schoolwork. Despite this procrastination, this was also an experience that forced me out of my comfort zone and into a situation where I couldn't just take the easy way out. I couldn't make excuses or take shortcuts, as the resulting consequences wouldn't just be to the detriment of some arbitrary school assignment. They would be of detriment to a space that would be in use for decades. I actually had to try. And I had to hold myself accountable. And yeah, the responsibility wasn't all great. Dealing with expensive materials could be stressful at times. But on the whole, having no easy way out forced me to create a better product, as well as to develop as a person. And although at times, although it may not have been comfortable or easy, it undeniably did me some good. I am immensely satisfied that I was able to create something that will not only outlive the duration of the project itself, but hell, it, e it may even outlive me. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Oh. 
Sorry, I can't really see very well. If someone's got their hand up, the lights are really bright. Great, good on you. Um, Eden, that was brilliant, and it's good to see it finished after hearing about it, so that's great. Um, I, was, I came in a bit late, so I may have, you may have con uh, said about, but did mm. you have to get council approval? No, I didn't. Uh, the reason it's so small is so we could fit within the sort of, we could fall under the council guidelines, so that's the reason the big one was going to be very illegal. It's because, like, yeah, it would definitely not. It was way too big to fall within council like guidelines. So yeah, it's it's three by three point five meters, which is I believe is ten meters squared, and the maximum size before needing council approval is fourteen meters squared, I believe. So a little, we could have gone a little bit bigger, but just to sort of you know, be on the safe side. Yeah. Um, Stewie. Hi, Eden. Uh, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, just curious, have you got plans? Um, it's a beautiful space you've got there. Plans of making it um, self-sufficient by installing solar and batteries? Um, I haven't really thought about that. Um, I guess we could. Uh, it is already wired up, though, and it, it, it's, it's not... It doesn't consume an awful lot of power because, like, we intentionally like designed it and got you know products for it that wouldn't take up a lot. Currently, the sort of only source of you know heat in that building is a small sort of panel heater on the side wall, which is it doesn't really draw much power at all. So, unless you've got a massive TV going in there, I think you'll be a good yeah. But yeah, food for thought, I suppose. Um, Anyone else? Got one here for you, Eden. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned you use um, Google SketchUp for all your design work. Yes. Um, have you used it for anything else subsequently or gone back to the old tools of uh, weapons of mass destruction? I actually have. I use it for a couple of school assignments. It's a pretty, it's a really intuitive and easy to use like website or software. It's, yeah, it's, it's great. I've, it's just great to know, just have a perfect, 3D model of everything with all of the exact dimensions, sort of sizes, the way everything interacts with each other. Because, like, of course, you can you can have all the dimensions right, but things can sort of overlap and bump up, and it's really great to just have it all sorted out there before you start dealing with things that, you know, they could be hundred dollar mistakes. So, yeah, Connor. What are you planning to use the room for after? Um, so, currently it's still quite uh, stinky because <laughs> of the off-gassing, but eventually I hope to sort of... Well, currently it's a bit of an all-purpose space, um, sort of just so that, like, you know, people can go down there and relax. I've done quite a lot of homework in there. I actually practiced this speech a ton in there because um, it's a nice little box that you can just sort of shout in and no one hears you. Um, yeah, uh, I sort of hope to move some more furniture in to make it a little bit more comfortable in there. But apart from that, I think it's just going to stay an all-purpose space that can just sort of be used as the need arises. So if I, you know, I have a sleepover, I can have we can stay in there instead of my little room. Or you know, if Mum wants to teach yoga to like I don't know four people at max, um, <laughs> <laughs> she can do that too. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Oh, Zaid. <laughs> okay. Have you considered painting either the inside or the outside with maybe like a mural, considering uh, you're an, such a good artist? Well, funny you should ask that, because Levi is actually considering doing murals for his Year 12 project. So maybe he can like paint the back wall. I wouldn't be against that. So, <laughs> yeah, so maybe he can do that. Um, yeah. Just a question up the back. Is this on? Oh, sorry, question? Um, oh. Hi, Eden. That was a great presentation and a great little building to do whatever you're going to do in it. Um, one of the things about this education is a whole lot of love, a whole lot of reverence, and a whole lot of freedom. And I'm wondering what your sense of freedom about yourself is now that you've constructed a building 
um, with your own hands? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't really know. I mean, it's, it's great to sort of know what you're capable of. Like, I, going into this year, I wasn't just sort of doubtful of my building, like, capabilities. I was sort of doubtful that I'd actually be able to mo be motivated enough to do it. So it's sort of coming out of it, like, after waking up, like, myself up during, you know, holidays, which, you know, by all means, like, should have been for holidaying and not, you know, being on the tools all day. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I was pretty self, I'm pretty happy to say that I was quite self-motivated throughout this. Um, and it's good to come out of that and be able to go, yeah, like, I did that, and mostly of my own accord, with the exception of a bit of extra motivation from mum and dad. Yeah. Um, obviously the skills too, because it's like, you know, now I know how to build buildings, and I don't think people will ever not need houses, so it's pretty useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone else? Oh, India. Well done, Bung. I mean, Eden, sorry. <laughs> um, is construction that. something that you're thinking of going into in the future? Um, yeah, uh, well, not, not yet, yeah, but good question, yeah. Um, I really did enjoy this. I'm not sure if I'd do it professionally. I, I feel like doing it for money might sort of suck the soul out of it. Um, but I would definitely like to do more of this stuff in the future, just sort of like DIY things. Like, I, it, it's really hard to say without sounding really selfish, but I really enjoyed this because I got to build it for, like, me and, like, my family, and, like, I knew I was going to use it so I could, like, design it accordingly and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, I'd definitely like to do some more of it in the future, probably. Yeah. Um, any more? <laughs> Sorry, I really can't see. Right. Oh, it's fixed. Good. Right. Uh, so now for the uh, the teary thank yous. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my mum and dad, without whose help my project literally, like very literally, would not have been possible. Uh, Dad, I don't think I'll really ever be able to repay you, both in terms of money and, like, physical sort of effort and help. You always provided that extra push to keep me motivated and were a constant source of ideas and just, in general, amazing person to work alongside. Mum, I am hugely appreciative of all the help with the paint and colours, as well as just, in general, with everything. I immensely appreciate both you guys, all of the stress, sweat, time, and uh, let's just call it vitamin M that you guys put into <laughs> my project. Uh, Levi, uh, I'd like to thank you for all those times when you're super eager to help to hold the ladder when I was um, no more gapping the eaves. I'd like to give a, give a huge thanks to my grandfather. Thank you, John. Um, without your generosity, skill and guidance, both my project and, well, me, wouldn't be in the places we are now. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Margarita, for allowing us to borrow your husband and for all the food. It's always really delicious. Um, I'd like to thank Andrew and Samantha of Allgate Mitre 10, who, through which we supplied all of our materials. Those two were amazing consultants regarding any materials or products that we were unsure about. Uh, I'd like to thank Lance Carl for being so generous with his very expensive time. He taught me a great deal about Strawbell Building and that people are usually very willing to help. You just have to ask. I'd like to thank the school and its um, inhabitants. Thank you, Elise and Eleanor, for being so diligent and putting so much effort into ensuring we all do well, as well as Fiona my project supervisor, who, although our meetings were few and far between, um, was always a great source of guidance and advice. And finally, lucky last, I'd like to thank my class. 
without whose help and companionship, I doubt I'd be the person I am. You guys are all amazing. I look forward to all of your speeches, and that's it. Thank you. Our next speaker has been uh, feeding us little treats and sustaining us throughout the year. I'd like to welcome Ashley. What draws people to French patisserie? Is it the taste, the appearance, the way it melts in your mouth, or is it the way it transports you to the cobblestone streets of Paris in one bite? Come with me as I take you on a journey to discover the perfect recipe for my divine project. Cooking and baking has always interested me. There is something about the precise measurements and the step-by-step -step instructions that I find enjoyable. I also find satisfy satisfaction in the end product and how people react to receiving the food I've made for them. I decided to take on French patisserie as an enjoyable challenge for my year 12 project, which would allow me to extend and develop my cooking skills through experimenting with difficult recipes. When I th first thought about developing my cook, I remembered back to year seven, where I cooked macarons for the first time. I do not remember them that well, but they were pink and fluoro green, with no flavor and whipped cream filling. I did not like the taste of them, but the joy and excitement I felt after making them was incredible. to make the year a little more fun. After my year seven experience, I knew that there was still a lot I needed to learn before I was able to attempt making macaron again. And this ignited my desire to perfect macarons as one of the first step for my project and then extend my learning with other recipes. I knew I would, do, I would need to do more than just bake, but like almost every other year 12 student, I didn't realize just how much I needed to do. I did endless research on different recipes on the internet and in books. I found work experience at Moulot's Patisserie in Unley and spent time during the school holidays and most Sunday mornings, observing and assisting Andre, the owner who kindly agreed to be my mentor. I experimented with different recipes many times over until I was happy with the results. For my community aspect, I ran the cooking, the high school cooking elective where I taught my recipes. From working with the elective, I was able to produce a recipe book that became my artifact. So, let's continue the journey. First, 
when you start a recipe is the ingredients. How is it that at the start of the year I had made formless blobs, but later perfectly macarons? How did I go from a doughy pastry to a crispy vanilla slice? The ingredients were all the same, so what changed? My project has showed me when it comes to cooking and French patisserie, the skills and technique of the cook are the main ingredients. I think the key ingredients to my success this year are aerating, folding, piping, following the recipe, and communication. Many recipes require the process of aerating to make the mixture rise and create a lighter, fluffier dessert. In the past, I have been used to yeast, flour, and carbohydrates to make the mixture rise, so the idea of using egg whites in their place was new to me. Aerating the dessert, important step to all my recipes. If the mixture does not have enough air in it, the dessert will rise and collapse instead of just rising and staying fluffy. Folding occurs with the and the puff pastry, but they are completely different processes. Folding the egg whites is, very, is a very delicate skill which involves combining the whisked egg whites with another mixture. Whisking the egg whites creates small air pockets and you need to be careful not to break them when folding. I found, it, I found that the best technique for folding is to scoop the mixture from one side of the bowl under the mixture, around and over the top, sealing in the egg whites. All the egg whites have to be folded in evenly, otherwise the clumps will cause holes in the dessert. It is important to resist the urge of stirring the mixture as it will break the pockets. I did this a few times because I was impatient and the desserts did not turn out very well. Folding pastry is lit is simpler and more literal, like the action of folded paper. For the puff pastry, the butter is sealed by folding the edges of the dough onto the, pa onto the butter. The dough is then turned over, rolled out, folded into thirds, and then rolled out again. This process is repeated approximately five times to achieve multi the multiple layers needed. And then it needs to be placed in the fridge for 20 minutes between each fold. It was really interesting to see the end results and showing the many layers of the pastry. Piping involves squeezing the mixture from the bag onto, a, onto the baking paper in a controlled way usually in a circular motion. I have learned a lot about piping through making macarons. The mixture has to be the right consistency before piping. It has to be completely incorporated together, otherwise some shells will have air pockets or chewy clumps of the mixture. It also took a lot of practice to pipe all the macaron shells evenly. I began piping the macarons onto a silicon tray so I could get the right size. However, as I only had one silicon tray, it was an awfully slow process, especially when I needed to make 100 shells at a time. I decided to pipe the macaron shells straight onto baking paper, and I found I was able to make them very neat. Following the steps and the order of the recipe is important. French patisserie uses simple ingredients with intricate steps and a required order of process. It is really easy to miss a step or mix up steps, 
and the slightest change can have a huge effect on the final outcome of the design. Some of my recipes had over 20 steps. So getting to the end and realizing that you missed an earlier step was very frustrating. An inedible mess to the chooks. Communication plays a huge role in cooking, both in the recipe and in the kitchen. The recipe needs to be clear and stepped out and easy to follow to reduce the risk of miscommunication. When I was writing the recipes for the cooking elective, I, was, I had to make sure that the recipes were simple and easy to follow and that each step was a single activity. It was also ridiculously hard to make sure that I was not assuming an understanding of cooking techniques or terminology. So I asked my mum to read through the recipe and note down any steps she did not understand. In a recipe, the method is how you combine the ingredients to make the final product. My method included experimentation, work experience, cooking electives, and my recipe book, which you can find out in the foyer. The majority of my project was done through recipe experimentation. Constant experimentation is vital for this kind of project, as the desserts and techniques can only be, per be perfected with practice. I began by making some terrible looking desserts that did not taste particularly good, but through constant experimentation, I ended the year with almost perfect desserts. This has taught me a lot about perseverance, as it was very disheartening to spend hours in the kitchen and end up with an inedible mess, but at least the chooks enjoyed it. I was fortunate to arrange regular work experience at Moulot's Patisserie with Andre. At first, I was challenged by going there, as I felt self-conscious and shy. However, Andre was incredibly open and friendly, and always happy to let me watch what he was doing. I was able to observe and often assist him in rolling out pastries, making a croque and bush, macarons, and so much more as well as helping, with, helping him with the dishes, of course. I was able to ask Andre questions, which was very helpful. Early on in my project, I took a sample, of, sample macaron for Andre to taste. He was very encouraging, but also very generous, as he gave me his macaron recipe, which I have used many times since, and found that it always works well. I got a lot out of doing work experience, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. For my community aspect, I thought it would be fun to teach what I was learning to some students at the school. My initial idea was to work with a small group of students who had previous cooking experience so that I could extend their knowledge with these recipes. That didn't go quite as I planned, and I ended up with 22 students in the high school cooking elective. At first, it was very intimidating to think that I was gonna teach this many students. I developed a plan to separate them into small groups of three or four, and ensured that they all would have a task to do so they wouldn't get bored. I found that this worked quite well, and the students really enjoyed it. The last step of a recipe is the results. Through my project, I made some key discoveries about techniques and ingredients, which were essential for my success, and were centered around the desserts, the macarons, ganache, creme brulee, souffle, chocolate mousse, eclairs, profiteroles, puff pastry, and the vanilla slice. The first exciting challenge I chose to take on was making macarons. 
I knew from prior experience that they were going to be difficult to make, so I set out to perfect them first. To perfect them, I practiced and tested the recipe multiple times to the point where my family were getting tired of eating the results. I found a lot of joy in making the macarons, just being able to see approximately 100 macaron shells turn into 50 fully formed macarons was incredible. The very first time I made macarons this year was back in February. The shells were flat and chewy. The problem was with the egg whites from using a normal hand mixer rather than a stand mixer. At this point, I took the financial hit and bought a stand mixer on the recommendation of my mentor. I was able to make macarons with the stand mixer, and I was really excited to see how different the egg whites were going to be. There was a shine to the egg whites after I, made, after I added the sugar water, and this showed a strength to the mixture. I was also able to turn the bowl upside down without them falling on me. Working on improving the macarons through experimentation and incorporating better tools has shown me that although something can be hard at first, practicing it multiple times can change the outcome. A good macaron will have a crunchy first layer of the shell, then an immediate soft layer of the shell, followed by the flavor sensation of the ganache which is where all the flavor is. Next time you eat a macaron, I hope you take, the, take a moment to enjoy the taste and the texture. Although I learned how to make macarons well, there, are some, there were some unforeseen circumstances that impacted the outcome. Now, if you would picture this, I was standing in my kitchen at 10 p.m. There were trays and trays of macarons on every surface, waiting to be cooked, when the oven stops working. <laughs> I was feeling quite panicky and worried about what to do with all these uncooked shells. There was nothing I could do that night, so I stored them carefully in a cool room where they would be safe and my parents took them to our neighbor's house the next morning to cook. The literal translation for creme brulee is burnt cream, as it is a custard cream with a burnt or caramelized sugar, which gives it the golden look and the hard layer on top. I found it incredibly satisfying to burn the sugar on the top of the creme brulee, and I really enjoyed tapping the shell it created. I learned that the perfect creme brulee has a slight wobble to, this, to the center of the mixture when it first is removed from the oven. It should be yellow in color, and the slight wobble should decrease after it's been cooked. To burn the sugar, to burn the sugar nicely, there has to be an even spread of caster sugar over the surface of the creme brulee. Using the blowtorch to melt the sugar, I discovered that it is important to start torching from the edge of the mixture in a spiral towards the center. The middle of the creme brulee will be more caramelized than the outside, since the hot caramel, caramelized sugar will travel downwards as the middle is usually lower than the edges. The next dessert I took on was a popular favorite, the chocolate mousse. I've been making and using this recipe for many years, but through this, but the pro, this project has helped me understand the inner workings of aerating the mixture, the importance of folding the egg whites. When I have made this recipe at home, I had to use, I used dark chocolate to give the mixture a bitter bite, rather than it being too sweet. For the cooking elective, we used dark chocolate as well, 
and I have since realised that younger people prefer sweet milk chocolate. Also, the mousse seems to taste better in a nicer glass. I did not enjoy the mousse as much when we served it in little white coffee cups, which was all I could find for the cooking elective. When I make the mousse at home, I use parfait glasses. There is something about the ambiance of how the dessert is served that improves the taste. Another dessert I took on this year was the souffle. Souffles are almost like light fluffy cakes, but smaller. The fluffiness comes from whisking the egg whites, allowing the mixture to aerate. The recipe has many steps and the process is long. Souffles have to be served immediately, otherwise they will collapse. This does not change the taste, but it's not very pleasing to look at. What I have learned through, work, through my work with souffles is that when cooking, it's best if the oven light is working. So you can see how long, that they, how long they need to cook for. My oven light has been broken all year. So I had to open the door slightly and carefully. And although opening the door can result in the souffle collapsing, no one seemed to notice but me. Another essential challenge for a p French patisserie project was attempting to make puff pastry from scratch. Puff pastry is made up of multiple layers of dough and has a golden brown colour. The layers give the, dough, give the pastry a flaky look, and although it's flaky, it shouldn't fall apart. The many layers come from the intricate folding method. Make the dough, cover the dough in butter, place the dough in the fridge, roll the dough out, fold it again, place it back in the fridge for 20 minutes, and repeat it five times. Each time the dough is removed from the oven, it has to be rolled out again, which gets trickier after a while as the dough starts to warm up and the layers start to separate. The dough builds up memory of the layers and when it's cooked, the heat cooks each layer and rises it in the process. Making puff pastry was so much fun. Seeing all the layers appear was extremely rewarding as it takes a lot of time and care to make the, to make the recipe. My first attempt at puff pastry blew up to about 10 centimetres, but it quick, quickly collapsed when I cut it. I learned from this experience and was able to make a good, creme brulee, a good puff pastry that didn't collapse and was about three centimetres. This leads me to Milfoy, which directly translates to thousand cre sa sorry, a thousand layers. But here we call it a vanilla slice. A vanilla slice is simply a thick layer of custard between two sheets of puff pastry with an icing sugar or an icing mixture on top. The icing mixture is more of a classic vanilla slice look, but I preferred sprinkle icing sugar over the top. The custard needs to be thick to hold the form between two pastry sheets. It tends to be yellow in colour which is from the heated milk and the egg yolks. The custard has a very mild flavour, but it complements the pastry well. Piping the custard on the pastry is a similar skill to the macarons, but it doesn't have to be as neat. At the start of the year, I plan to establish new skills in the kitchen and attain a greater knowledge for the delicate art of French patisserie. Through the year, I learned that, the people, that people are attracted to French patisserie for many reasons. The appearance, 
the taste, the combination of tastes, the textures, and the melt-in-the-mouth moments. I was drawn to the, to the challenge of creating some of the most memorable desserts and, of course, getting a taste of France all in one bite. My process and progress this year was very rewarding. It has made me realize the power of tackling big challenges, experimentation, and practice. I took a big risk this year, and luckily it paid off. I encourage others to take risks and challenges because you never know how far you have come or what you'll achieve if you don't. Thank you. Are there any questions? Well done, Ashley. Um, <laughs> I've heard a lot about your cooking exploits over the course of the year. Um, I was wondering if, at the end of all these like amazing experiments, you've come up with a favourite recipe, one that really you want to make again a few times? Yeah. Um, my favourite through this whole process was creme brulee. Um, yeah, torching is very fun. <laughs> um, one of the easiest to make, so. Connor. Good job, Ashley. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions for you. Okay. What, why are you so fussy on your, mate, your dessert, look, on the looks of your dessert when it's all about the taste? Um, I think the dessert needs to look nice and be presented in a nice way for it to taste even better than just the normal taste on its own. And the second question is, what was your, what's the, what was your favourite dessert to make, eat, and your least favourite dessert to eat? <laughs> um, So creme brulee was my favourite to make and eat. Um, <laughs> Soufflés are now my least favourite to both make and eat. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's very hard to see them cook without a light in the oven. <laughs> Is catering something you would think about? Um, I don't think so. It was very um, to cater for Ned's performance. Um, yeah, that, that was a lot of macarons. Yeah. Um, you made a few, uh, a few creations, not creations, but you've made a few things this year. Which one was the most rewarding to have sort of mastered yeah, um, I think the puff pastry, because I've always been, I've always used the puff pastry, um, and you just, <laughs> um, so making that from scratch was really rewarding, yeah. Sorry about the stress, Ashley. <laughs> um, right. How long does it take you to make a batch of macarons? One batch. Um, just to make the shells, it takes about an hour, and then they cook for about an hour, and then you make the ganache, and then you put it all together. So it's about three hours. Yeah, and I made three batches for your performance. <laughs> but it was all at once, so it was easier. Tess? Thank you, Ash. Um, everyone always has an amazing reaction to all of your foods you create, and I was just wondering if there's been any time where you've had other reactions. <laughs> um, yes. Um, 
I was hosting, or we were, my family was hosting a dinner night with my cousin and her family, and she didn't really like the taste of the souffle. And she told me about it, and that's why I hate them now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ashley, and well done for persevering with the audio. You did a really, really good job there. Um, I was wondering, I, I know you spent some time in Germany um, on an exchange. I was wondering if you could talk to why you chose um, French patisserie as opposed to maybe some um, inspiration from German um, cakes. Um, that's a good question. Um, when I was in Germany, I was there for Christmas, um, so I was able to make some of the, Germ the traditional German dessert with um, my host family. Um, and I've always had a passion for wanting to go to France um, since I went there back in 2012 um, to just try and recreate those memories again. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Ashley. Sorry, over here. That's it. Uh, well done on your presentation. That was really interesting to hear the process. Um, if you were to scale that up, would there be any changes in the recipe, or is it something that scales up, um, sort of, like, just expands with the numbers? Sorry? Is it something you can scale up with the recipes? The, the sizes of the recipe, does it scale up easily? Um, like, as in the steps of the recipe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I made the rest, the, the steps of the recipe for the elective. Um, so all of them, I tried to keep the same, so it would be the same throughout the um, recipe book. Um, but most of it, it probably can be cut down into like 15 steps, but then it would just look like blocks of writing and that kind of does get confusing, yeah. Well done, Ashley. Thank and thanks for the tips on the, the brulee. I always <laughs> fail at that. Um, and as Naya will tell you, I've got a flamethrower at home. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether there'd been any particular sort of emotional moments for you in, in the process, like with any of the challenges that you'd faced, and whether you felt like there's been much sort of personal growth uh, related to the project work. Yeah. Um, at times, with some of the macarons, the many, many macarons and the puff pastry, some of the more challenging desserts have um, tested my patience a lot. <laughs> um, and if something didn't turn out really the way I wanted it to, I did get very disheartened at times. Um, yeah. And sorry, what was the second part? Um, has there been any personal growth around the project for you? Do you feel like you've changed or, you know, grown in any way in relation to it? Um, I think so. I've now learned how to be more patient with the recipe. And I know that you should definitely read through a recipe first and not just start making it. <laughs> I, that happened a couple of times and I spent way too long trying to find an ingredient that we didn't actually have. <laughs> Yeah. Connor. How does it make you feel not, even with the messy, serving up messy desserts, that knowing that I'll always like it? Um, yeah, it, it's all right. Um, I do prefer a nicer looking dessert. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. You, you must have a lot of chalks. <laughs> uh, no, I was, just four. <laughs> I was wondering if the age or the freshness of the egg makes a difference for any recipes like the macaron, in particular, the using the whites? Um, possibly. I haven't really looked into that. Um, one of the first macaron recipes I looked at said that the that you you should crack the kneaded egg whites and then put a 
um, plastic wrap over them and then put them in the fridge for about two days for some reason. And it didn't seem to make a difference, but <laughs> yeah. Hi, Ashley. We've got one from online. Um, it's how long did it take to make the pastry? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I timed it, but just for the folding, it would have taken about an hour. Um, and then it needs to be rolled out a final time and then cut into the pieces you want. So probably about an hour and a half to two hours if you include cooking time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you ever kind of had the desire to make your own recipe, like venture out into that type of field um, or tweak it a bit in your own way. I did tweak most of the recipes because I found that um, some of the recipes just weren't working, so I made them work and then wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Um, but if I had more time, I think I would have tried to make the whole recipe from scratch. But yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Okay. I'd like to thank Sue Catlow for being my supervisor and helping me run the electives. Thank you for all your hard work and the many hours of trying to calm me down from freaking out about the 22 students. <laughs> Thank you to Kathy for being my support supervisor, for the interest and the support you've shown with my project. Eleanor, thank you for your constant support and guardian guidance through the year. To Elise, thank you for being, thank you for always being there throughout the year and your support through all the years of school. To mum, thank you for reading and rereading and rereading the recipes and my multiple speech drafts. Thank you for staying up late to support me finishing writing my thesis. I don't think I would have completed this year without you. Dad, thank you for helping me with the cooking, trying to fix the oven when it died. And thank you for always being there to lighten my mood. Connor, thank you for staying out of the house while I was writing my thesis. <laughs> thank you for always being my biggest fan when it comes to my cooking, even when most of your feedback was, yeah, it was good. <laughs> to Andre and Annette, who couldn't be here tonight, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to work at Milots this year, and to Andre for being my mentor. Thank you to the High School Cooking Elective for being patient and letting me teach you. To everyone who was willing to eat the desserts, especially the macarons, after my many, many attempts. Thank you. To the class, thank you for the willingness to eat the desserts and the constant support. This year wouldn't have been the same without you all by my side. And lastly, Thank you to the audience and the live streamers for joining us tonight. Thank you.
Please help me welcome to the stage the next student who has been exploring curiosity and perfectionism through sculpture. Please welcome Charlotta Nielsen. I remember a few years ago watching a child on his birthday opening all of his gifts. A few minutes later, the toy truck and farm animals lay discarded on the floor, and guess what he played with for the rest of the day? It was a cardboard box which had held one of his gifts and could now be anything he wanted, a car, a cubby house, or even a rocket. So, at what point in our lives could we only see a box? Francis Bacon called wonder broken knowledge, a gap in understanding that can fuel art. Author Sarah Lewis characterized curiosity and creativity in a similar way, saying that creativity is like the preparation for innocence. Through this year, I learned that darkness and curiosity do something that is important for the human being. These phrases capture the essence of something powerful and an idea that became extremely significant to my project. This question is where my project ended up, with the exploration of curiosity and creativity and what they mean for our lives, particularly in the context of perfectionism. But it is far from where I began. Let me circle back to the beginning of the year and take you on the journey I went on to reach this understanding. It is hard for me to pinpoint exactly the moment this project took shape, but it began with the idea of art. We all have a desire to find meaning in the world, and for me, I do this through art. I wanted to extend myself beyond what I had done before, and to do this, I chose sculpture, which was a medium I had very little previous experience with. I knew I wanted to centre the works around something that I had a personal connection to. Perfectionism was an idea that had been in the back of my mind for the last year or two, but I'd never really taken the time to explore it in depth. I contrasted this with resilience, hoping that through the process of combining these two ideas, I could reach a new viewpoint. At least in the beginning, I saw resilience and perfectionism as being related to one another, believing that resilience was the opposite to perfectionism or that in the absence of perfectionism, there is resilience. While resilience added some context to perfectionism, the further I got into the project, I almost unconsciously let resilience go. Its connection to my other themes wasn't as strong as I had thought it would be, and there was enough research to be done on perfectionism alone. Through various iterations, my project grew and changed, ending up in discoveries that I never would have imagined. Most of us really want to offer the world something of quality, something that is good and important, both for ourselves, but also for others. We can worry about our purpose and how we're gonna to contribute to the world. This fear was for me, and I think it can be for others as well, what held me back and stopped me from creating and sharing my works, particularly this year during the project. It felt like I'd been immersed in darkness, the unknown. There was something necessary about being in this space. When you walk into a dark room, what is the first thing you want to do? Turn on the lights. Learning something new is like being in that dark room, and the impulse to turn on the lights has been one I've had all year. In the summer holidays leading up to year 12, I was excited to learn something new. But as soon as I began creating, this was quickly replaced with discomfort. This part of the project was characterized by a psychological cycle of being afraid of judgment and reckoning with my expectations. To turn on the lights and see, returning to what I know, was all I wanted to do. And particularly in the first half of the year, 
I found myself gravitating towards this light, often getting stuck in old patterns of thought. To be in the dark can be scary, but it also allows us to think differently and explore a whole new world. Over this year, I got better at being in this space, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Initially, I struggled to differentiate perfectionism from striving. Even trying to understand perfectionism and the common uses for this word wasn't simple, because I felt that there were aspects of this concept that were actually good, and it was more a matter of balance. As it turns out, the line between perfectionism and healthy striving is a wobbly one, and one that must often be self-determined by the individual. For me, the line is drawn when I begin to care so much about other people's opinions that I do things to try and please them that don't necessarily align with myself. At the beginning of my project, though, I didn't have any idea what these terms meant to me. And so I immersed myself deep into the minds of others, trying to find a starting position. I clung to the illusion that I would be able to go through this year without ever revealing the personal. And I realize now that this is why I began with the research. I searched for works that inspired me, as well as works that were worlds away from what I was imagining. I looked for people's stories, hoping that someone would capture things in a way that aligned with my experiences, but still kept it slightly removed. I was interested in the messy web of ideas that surround perfectionism and resilience, but deep down, I hoped to untangle them and make them not messy. This wasn't a conscious thought process, but in the beginning, a three-step recipe that was easily implementable was definitely what I was searching for. I very quickly realized that perfectionism couldn't be isolated from surrounding ideas, and therefore, this idea was not going to work. But these insights gave me a better understanding of myself and my process. It wasn't until I began intervie interviewing professional sculptors that my project started to come to life. All of their individual stories and creations were inspiring, and after each one, I began creating with a newfound enthusiasm. I love talking to these people about why they created art, and it was partly these experiences that kept me going. As humans, we have a hunger for knowledge, especially when there are visible patterns in this information that form schemas. If I asked you to picture a house in your mind right now, I am relatively certain it would look something like this. A door in the middle, windows with crosses in them, and a triangular roof. We would all picture something similar, because this is what our river of experience tells us a house should look like. From childhood, we build these images of how the world works, and from then on, we try and fit any new information into these schemas. Based on our experiences, people can also have what are called maladaptive schemas. Often through different emotional experiences, people form maladaptive perceptions of themselves and the self in relation to others. Under one of these maladaptive schemas comes perfectionism. And in the beginning of the year, this was one of the guiding ideas which formed a strong base from which to continue exploring. Now that some research had been done, I decided to begin creating. The act of creating was one of the most meaningful processes in my project, even though at first I thought it would be supplementary. It is what helped me digest information and work out the parts that were relevant. It was also one of the most challenging, because I had very few skills, and often my ideas didn't translate well from thoughts into forms. Even though I was trying to free this process, I felt so much pressure to create in a certain way. Usually, I would start by sketching my ideas before making a marquette to tweak the design and then beginning on the final work. This was really good in the beginning, but it became too structured for what I wanted to do. 
Even a half-life sculpture, which was all I was going to create, took many hours to complete. And so I decided to take much more of an experimental approach, so I would be able to explore more ideas. I had to keep reminding myself of something my mentor said to me in our very first meeting, which turned out to be a, a reoccurring theme among the artists I interviewed. This was the value of time and practice, particularly when you are learning something new. It was the idea that you have to show up regularly in order to improve, and that by simply showing up and beginning to create something, anything, whether it stayed or was later reshaped, was a vital part of sorting through ideas and learning skills. While I conceptually understood the importance of practice, I unconsciously fought it, unwilling to accept that it was true. It was really uncomfortable to sit in that place of not knowing, this metaphorical darkness filled with self-doubt and not see a way to move out of it. Here I was, sitting in front of this fresh ball of clay, and I had no idea where to even begin. I had ideas of armatures and support structures running through my brain, but there was something so captivating just about this extremely malleable substance on its own. To begin, I took a range of black and white photos of my family in different poses to get a feeling of depth, because it was impossible to get an idea of where the eye sockets sit, for example, from just a front-on photo alone. The photos from different angles were critical, because now there were many planes and dimensions that had to be considered. I found it quite challenging to move from two-dimensional to three-dimensional works, and in the beginning, my pieces looked quite flat, almost as if I was just drawing on a hunk of clay. I would always begin with a ball of clay, and then I would start to make dents and ridges to form basic shapes. Then I would build up the bone structure before adding fleshy parts, similar to the way you add shadows when you are drawing, always making sure that the smallest piece added worked from all the angles. From there, it was simply trial and error, looking from the photos to the sculpture and back to the photos, observing what worked and what didn't. Once I'd been working for a few hours and had let go of some of my expectations, I began to get into the flow, and the creating became quite meditative and less daunting. Initially, I held in my head this fuzzy image of what the sculptures would look like. I hoped that they would give people an experience or a feeling and somehow connect with something sitting deep within them. This idea partly drove and partly inhibited some of my early creations. Through my observations of a range of sculptures in galleries and coffee table books, I recognized that a certain vulnerability within the artist that would then be shared with others was crucial to create a sense of connection and a meaningful work. Again, I searched for a formula, but found that everyone did it slightly differently, some through their artist statements, others using a familiar symbol or color to create a connection between their experiences and the experiences of the viewer. I saw that for many artists, it was through working with those personal experiences that something beautiful and inspiring could emerge, but this didn't work the other way around. One couldn't simply set out with the aim to create a new, amazing and inspiring work and expect it to form from that expectation alone. This, in many ways, was the crux of my problem. After this realization, I started to create from memories. I made a range of prompts and used those experiences to create sculptures. This piece, for example, was based off one of my childhood memories. In my backyard, sun shining bright, arms raised into the air, on a log, completely proud and joyful, moments before jumping off. 
I found that the emotion and nostalgia that I was unconsciously adding to this piece made it all the more powerful. These experiences of the world that only I have, but that still leave room for the viewer's imagination, was what art was all about. Some of the earlier excitement began to return to me as I saw some of these distant memories begin to take a more tangible form. A little over halfway through the year, though, my project wasn't at all going in the direction I'd hoped it would. All of my initial words, like perfectionism, didn't seem to hold the same meaning anymore because I knew they were no longer capturing my ideas and aims. The image of what perfectionism in my mind was a distorted one. My initial approach had been trying to address the problem in a physical way, without exploring what was going on within. I almost decided that by knowing more about it and showing this understanding in the physical works, that that would be enough. I designed the works to have deliberate imperfections in them, but part of me hoped for those imperfections to be executed perfectly, matching the sketches I'd made down to the smallest detail. This led me to begin feeling that my ideas and my works were sitting on very different levels. I tried to work around this, experimenting with working blindfolded and without sketches. And from these experiences, I began to realize that there was much more than I was seeing. The answer to this problem, it turns out, wasn't to be found in a book or research paper. Rather, it unexpectedly came from a conversation. Something that my mentor mentioned in one of our regular meetings stuck with me and led to a pivotal point of discovery. I didn't know it at the time. In fact, I just scrolled it in the mess of other notes. But I kept coming back to this idea that imperfection was an oversimplified opposite to perfectionism. Imperfection couldn't be disregarded entirely, as, to a certain degree, it was the thing I was trying to embrace. The problem was the way that I'd been defining perfectionism almost implied that it was cr through creating unfinished or less refined works that you changed your mindset. This wasn't completely true because the intention behind it still hadn't changed, bringing the focus back to my internal process. From the beginning, through accidental nudges and unstable internal structures, I ended up with many pieces missing arms, legs, and feet. While I wanted to figure out ways for them to still be usable, as this was the whole idea of my project, to be honest, I wasn't at all okay with it, fearing that I was gonna have to stand up here at the end and have nothing to show. It was here that I began experimenting with the Japanese philosophy of kintsugi, where vessels are repaired with a golden lacquer. The cracks tell a story of the world we live in and the journey of the work. They illustrate control and of letting go, and the idea of picking up the pieces and making something new. Using these broken works and ones I'd intentionally smashed, I began exploring how I could use this idea. After the pieces had been bisque fired, glazed, and fired again, which was no simple task, as even the smallest fragments had to be glazed, I set about the preparation for lead lighting. Placing copper tape on all the edges wasn't easy, as they'd all broken quite roughly, meaning that there were pieces missing and nothing sat completely flat. Deborah Lutz and I then had to trial the strength of the solder because this was something we had never tried before and we weren't sure whether the copper tape was going to adhere to the clay. It actually worked quite well and so the last step was to slowly try and piece the sculpture back together, propping it up so it could be soldered. It was fascinating to see the difference between the original and what it looks like now 
and to observe how hesitant I was to break or even fire some of the pieces. While it looks quite different from what I was imagining, it is also quite interesting in terms of texture and form, and it was mostly exciting to make. This philosophy of Kintsugi encapsulated many of the aspects of my project, and even though it was experimental, it is the work that best captures my journey and what creativity is, and so therefore it became quite a significant one. When I came across the quotes from Francis Bacon and Sarah Lewis, I came to this idea of the child, and I began to look further into their characteristics. When I was that age, I remember the pure joy that art brought me, and how exciting the small, new experiences seemed. I observed how curious and playful children usually are, and how that is often something we begin to lose as we grow older and more aware of the opinions of those around us. As I reflected on my initial research, I saw curiosity and play everywhere, both in the artists I interviewed and in the people from the elective I taught for a term. I now know that curiosity and creativity, rather than deliberate imperfection, is what is the antidote to perfectionism. While I had maybe lost aspects of some of these as I had grown up, I saw that they could be actively relearned and practiced. This idea filled me with a whole new set of questions, but also an underlying feeling of hope. Late into term three, I looked more deeply into creativity and the creative process, desperate to find an idea that would tie everything together. I would like to invite you for just a moment to think about where you are and what you were usually doing when you were the most creative. It could be anything or anywhere, but frequent answers are things like in the shower or on a walk, and for me, it is usually those few moments just before I fall asleep. While research has shown that there is not one single thing that informs creativity, it was clear from the range of characteristics that emerged that they were the opposite to many perfectionistic patterns of thought. Through creativity, we start a dialogue and a sharing of stories through which we can witness each other's common humanity, and that is what makes art so powerful. I had no idea how I was going to implement these ideas into my works and process. Maybe, to a certain degree, I was trying too hard, and in other ways, not hard enough. But part of my problem was it had taken me ages to find my way and wrap my head around these ideas. Even now, there are parts that aren't particularly clear, or aspects that seem important but don't fit with anything else and so I've left them on the side for later. By the time I had clarified my thoughts enough to reach curiosity and creativity and how they fit within the framework of my project, we were deep into thesis. Yet I now hold this piece of gold that I will be able to develop in the future. While my project had begun as much more of a practical venture, my sculptures are more than just the physical pieces. They capture a story of learning and my experiences through the year. I have come full circle, as the ideas I began with are the ones I ended up with, yet they have now been shuffled and rearranged and say something completely different. It was vital to my project that I begin with the unfamiliar, because through the process of learning the basics of anything new, Something in the way you think shifts. Upon reflection, it is almost like beginning with an artificial curiosity that eventually brought me to see things from a different perspective. So, while darkness can make us uncomfortable and afraid, we also seek it out for a few specific reasons. Darkness frees our minds from the knowing, allowing us to think differently 
and about ourselves and others. If we can learn to sit within this space, we can awaken our curiosity and see new po possibilities, sometimes leading to unexpected discoveries. Next time you are faced with curiosity, I encourage you to follow that question of what if and take one step forwards. We are all curious and we are all creative. So what are you curious about? What is your cardboard box going to be and how much time are you willing to invest in it? Thank you. Any questions? find that that was a really like positive experience or did you find that there were some things you had to learn in order to teach that and yeah how did that go yeah it was really good but i did have to learn a lot to do it um the things that they wanted to do were not at all what i'd learned through this project so they wanted to wheel throw and make pottery and so i had to quickly get a few lessons on that so i could try and help teach them but it was a really good experience, and I think through having to teach other people, I really worked out what I knew and what I didn't know. And yeah, when I reflected back on it, that's when I began to see kind of the things that became really important to my project. So yeah, it was really good. That was a great speech. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if that kind of piece of gold you found with, with curiosity um, has served you in any other area or if you've sort of seen it uh, be useful in any other part of your life. Um, just because I, I think it's, it's something that people have found in a lot of other areas as well, like um, meditation practices and mental health areas of therapy that this idea of curiosity can be the antidote to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if that has sort of played out in any other way. Yeah, I think it definitely has. Um, I think I'm still definitely learning so much more about it. And, but I think once I realized that, it became much more of a conscious thought process to like remind myself of that kind of way of thinking and what that meant for like my other things at school or even at home, and like how I could act more actively incorporate that kind of wanting just to know more, and it didn't really matter whether I was right or wrong, was really, it can be used anywhere, I think. Thanks for that, Charlotte, it was really, really good. Um, I was wondering if you'd, um, with the broken pieces that you made, um, it's a two-part question, I suppose. Did you, did you feel the need, from your perfectionist uh, viewpoint, did you feel the need to compare the before and the after, the broken and the fixed? And if so, which did you prefer? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So I think I definitely did compare them. I was really, like, with the ones I intentionally smashed, I was really hesitant to break them. And the first few I did didn't work at all. They all just like splintered off into these tiny little pieces that there's no way I could repair them. Um, but I think from an ideas point of view, I do like the finished, like the second option, the ones that have been repaired. Um, yeah, they're not exactly what I was thinking but I think they really capture something about what I was trying to explore. And so in that way, I think I like the second one better. Do you think it was, a, do you think it was 
it was good to be um, so perf perfection with your work, and if so, if not, why? Okay, that's a really good question. I really struggled with this um, because I think it has parts of it have definitely helped me out throughout the years. And I really, for me, struggled to draw that line between what was the really good bits of it and when it tipped to that side of not being good. Um, so I definitely think that there are parts of it that have helped me. Um, so was there a second part? Why? I think what perfectionism is, is it is a striving to do really, really well. And I think that bit can be important. But I think when it tips to the negative, obsessive side is when it can start to become a problem. So I think in balance, perfectionism can be good. But yeah, aspects of it can be good, I think. Yes. Yeah, the back. <laughs> um, that was a great speech. Uh, I Thank was you. just wondering if uh, you would pursue sculpture in the future. Okay, and I knew so, it. so um, perhaps not so perfectionist driven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's completely off the cards. Um, I think the reason I chose it was I really wanted to choose something that I'd never done before because I didn't feel like I could reach where I wanted to go if I was just sticking within something I knew. And so I think it really fulfilled its purpose there. And I did really enjoy the process. I think I am still more drawn at the end of this project to the other sides, like. Uh, painting and drawing, but I think I did really enjoy working in the 3D and kind of how that made you think about space and how the person experiences it. And so I think definitely as a hobby, it would be something that I would try again. Yeah, and probably less perfectionistic, hopefully. hopefully. Um, I was just wondering um, if you've managed to find a place to, um, like, out in the community or something that you want to um, display your work or sell it or anything else like that. Have you thought about those sorts of things? I haven't as of yet. Um, I'm not really sure at all what I'm going to do with them. There are a few that at this end of the year need a bit of repairing. Um, but I think, yes, there definitely would be a place for that. Uh, I'm just not sure what form it would take yet. Yeah, thank you. Charlotte, I have a question from Grace, who's been watching on the live oh. stream. Congratulations, she says. Is there an aspect of your research that you foresee as a future pathway? Ooh, good question. I think it definitely could be. I'm not at all sure what I want to do beyond this point, but I've really found it interesting to look at these thought processes and these ways of being human. And so I think there could definitely be something in the future that I would look into more in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotta, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed uh, and found fascinating what you said about um, going into the darkness of unknowing. And I'm just wondering if you've got a sensing of um, what lies beyond the fear that people encounter when they go into that darkness, because we live in an information age and we're, we're just bombarded with stimulation from all sides. So, um, yeah, can you share any insights you might have about um, why we might need to make friends with that darkness. Yeah, for sure. I, from my personal experience, I definitely found that like first step into that darkness like really, really hard. And for much of my project, I kind of just stayed like, I guess you could say in the semi-dark, like trying to be in that, but trying to not be. But I did find that later in the year, once I started creating more and more, 
there was almost like this threshold where you could jump over and then that fear wasn't there as much. And I think it was, it wasn't like a time thing, but it was the amount of time spent working. So it had to be like a few hours into working and then I'd be like, then some of that would go, but it couldn't, then the next day it would be back there again. So I think there is definitely something really important sitting on that other side. And I definitely found that it was where I had most of my ideas once I'd pushed through that first little bit of darkness. And yeah, and I think, I guess there's some light in that darkness or just some positive side to just being in the darkness. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, within the process of actualizing ideas, we often um, go through all of these problem finding processes as well as problem solving. What were some of the problems that you found that you were able to resolve in some way? Okay, I have quite a few answers. Um, I guess one of the more technical ones was when I was trying to create that soldered sculpture. I had to glaze all the sides that the copper tape was going to sit on. But the thing is, when you fire pieces, you can't have any glaze touching the kiln shelf, which meant that I had to find ways to balance the little, like, tiny pieces up against each other so no glaze would touch the kiln shelf, but it had to be glazed the whole way around. So that was definitely like a logistically challenging one. But I think the other one that springs to mind is I always wanted to work with glass. And I really, like, I really enjoyed the way that glass captures light and a fragility and a, also a strength. But there was, I didn't find anyone to work with this year. And so I tried to find some other ways to create that kind of nature. So letting light through. And one of them I found was surprisingly hot glue is like quite a good method to get a semi-transparent um, layer that can interact with light and give some similar properties to glass. So there are a few of the... Okay, thank you. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to thank my mentor. Thank you for agreeing to work with me this year. I know that we both had very busy schedules and I truly appreciate the time you put aside to help me. I've really valued all of your help, both on the practical and also the thesis. Thank you for teaching me the basics of how to sculpt and for asking me questions that made me have to clarify and change my thinking. Your questions and thoughts really did change the course of my project in so many ways for the better, and so thank you. There are so many people who have been involved in this project, and so I'd like to acknowledge all of them. Whether it was an email, or a conversation over the phone, or in person, thank you for all of your help. To my supervisor, Jessica, thank you for supervising me this year. Your technical knowledge and expertise was really helpful when I was trying to work out the logistics of different sculptures. And I'm really thankful for all of the ideas and questions you gave us to consider. Nonna. Thank you so much for helping me throughout all the stages of my project, both with refining in the beginning and all the ideas you threw at me throughout the year. To Robin. Thank you for listening to my speech and helping me to refine it. I'm really grateful for the extra time and effort you put in to help me. To my mum. Thank you for supporting me, both through giving me space when I needed it, but also boosts when I had to get going. Thank you for spending many hours reading over my, and editing my thesis, and for putting up with me and being so kind when I was stressed and less than easy. Thank you for having my back this year. To Don, thank you so much for your help and support, both with the practical side, like armatures, 
and also for looking over my thesis and giving me pointers on how to just get it done. It was just what I needed at the end of the holidays. To my dad, even though we couldn't really see much of each other this year, I've really loved the phone calls we have had discussing my project and sharing stories from school. Thank you for all of your support. To my brother, thank you for helping me have a little bit of fun this year and not take everything too seriously. Thank you also for your kind gestures, like making me a cake in thesis week, when I, you knew I would need that little bit extra to get me through. It did not go unnoticed. To Eleanor and Elise, thank you for your guidance throughout school, but particularly this year. Your kindness and wisdom was appreciated on a whole new level. Thank you for all of your hard work that you put into create a space that we can all be free to be creative and explore our individual interests. And finally, thank you to the class. You are such an incredible group of people who inspire me with your creativity and individuality. Thank you for all your support throughout the years, providing balance and the knowledge that I'm never alone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here tonight, and well done to this evening's courageous speakers. I want to recognize just how large a step it was over the threshold for some of you tonight. Well done. Yeah. Tonight we've witnessed connectedness, passion for learning, and courage to explore the unknown, and to interrogate the self in the process. Bravo, Class 12. And we have two more days to go. Sorry, some of you have to wait. <laughs> Please join us tomorrow morning at 9.30 to share more of Class 12's journeys. More adventure awaits. And now I invite tonight's speakers to um, walk out Class 12 to a last round of applause. Well done, everyone.